Welcome. My name is Debbie Doyle. I'm the meetings manager here at the American Historical Association. Thank you for attending our webinar on new diplomatic history, which is part of the AHA colloquium series of virtual AHA. We're excited to have you join us and are looking forward to a productive discussion. I would like to thank our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. You can support virtual AHA and other AHA activities by joining the association or, if you're already a member, making a donation today. We'll post links with details in the chat at the end of our conversation today. A few logistical things to cover before we start the webinar. By registering for or participating in the AHA's webinars, participants and panelists agree to abide by the AHA's Code of Professional Conduct. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions to the presenters. We hope to address all relevant questions, but also want to be mindful of the time, so we may paraphrase or combine questions. If you'd like to be part of the conversation on social media, remember to use the virtual AHA hashtag. Finally, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording on the AHA YouTube channel sometime in the next few weeks. I'll now turn things over to the chair of our session today, Daniel Riches from the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie, and hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, we are thrilled that so many of you are, are joining us today live and those of you who are or will be watching in the future on YouTube. It is my pleasure and my privilege to welcome you to this AHA Roundtable on the New Diplomatic History. Our panel today represents a wide range of geographic, chronological, and methodological coverage, bringing together scholars of Asian, African, Eastern and Western European and American history with interests stretching from late antiquity to the 21st century. What unites us is a common fascination with diplomatic history and in particular with the ways in which scholars have come to study diplomatic history in the last few decades. An historiographical development often referred to as the new diplomatic history and hence the, the title of our round table today. We strive today to encourage a rather free-flowing discussion of the current state of the field of diplomatic history, of the potentialities and the limitations of this new diplomatic history, and the directions we believe it could and should move in in the future. Our discussion will, of course, involve interaction between our panelists, and I personally am very excited to see the range of, of, of minds gathered here um, discussing these things together. Um, but we also very warmly welcome any of you in the audience who may wish to submit questions or comments to please join in by putting your questions or your comments in the Q&A function. Please also be reminded that the session is being recorded, as was mentioned, and will be posted on the AHA YouTube site, so just keep that in mind. Now, in order to get the conversation started, um, my co-panelists and I have come up with a list of three broad questions or themes that we will first take up in sequence with each of us on the round table doing our very best to hold our inner professors in check by speaking about each question briefly. Um, and I will, if need be, rudely interrupt um, the fellow professors and remind um, that we are democratic here and everyone gets to share time rather than in our classrooms where we don't have to do that. So we'll each speak about these things briefly before we move on then to the more general and less structured conversation, um, where once again, we would welcome your participation by joining us through the Q&A function. Before, however, starting with these three questions, I will briefly introduce each of my distinguished colleagues on the round table. Our first um, panelist is Nicolo de Cosmo, who received his PhD in Inner Asian History from the Indiana University in 1991 and after faculty students at the University of Cambridge, Harvard University, and the University of Canterbury in Australia, has been since 2003 at the Institute for Advanced Study, where he serves as Luce Foundation Professor in East Asian Studies. His research interests include ancient nomads and East Asian history, inner Asian political, cultural, and military history, Manchu and Mongol language and history, and medieval Eurasia and Silk Road studies. His most recent publications include several articles on climate and environmental aspects in Central Eurasian history, and the co-edited volume entitled Empires and Exchanges in Eurasian Late Antiquity, Rome, China, Iran, and the Steppe, 
circa 250 to 750, which was published with Cambridge in 2018. Another co-edited volume, Rebel Economies, Warlords, Insurgents, Humanitarians, is forthcoming very, very soon, my understanding is from Roman and Littlefield. Our second panelist is David C. Engerman, Leitner International Interdisciplinary Professor at Yale University and a specialist in international history. Between receiving his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in 1998 and joining Yale in 2018, he was on the faculty at Brandeis University. In addition to completing two books on Russia in American intellectual and political life, he has written widely on international development efforts. His current research focuses on the history of development economics, as well as the geopolitics of global economic inequality. He is also co-editor of the 1945 to the present volume of the Cambridge History of America and the World. Our third panelist is Andervati Felicite, Associate Professor of Early Modern and Modern German History at the University of Paris, Cite de Diderot. She received her PhD from the Sorbonne in 2012, and in 2016 published her first monograph, Négocier pour exister, les villes et duchés du nord de l'Empire face à la France, 1650 to 1730, published in the series Pariser Historische Studien of the German Historical Institute, Paris. Her main research fields are the history of early modern international relations and diplomacy and the history of the Holy Roman Empire. She is currently working on a project concerning the relations between the Holy Roman Empire and Persia. Our fourth panelist is Nana Osai Opare, an assistant professor of African and Cold War history and a faculty affiliate in the African and African American Studies Department at Fordham University. He has most recently published articles in the Journal of African History and the Journal of West African History. He's also published in popular media outlets such as the Washington Post and Foreign Policy and has been invited to and appeared in media outlets like New York City's Channel 5 News, Accra Star FM, a popular Ghanaian radio station, and Black Agenda Radio. He received his PhD in African History from the University of California, Los Angeles under the direction of Professor Andrew Apter. He also received Mapslers and Bachelors with honors degrees in history from Stanford University under the supervision of professors Robert Cruz and Sean Henretta. And finally, I am the fifth panelist. My name is, is Dan Riches. I am an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Alabama, where I have worked since receiving my PhD from the University of Chicago in 2007, and where I also serve as the director of graduate studies in my department. Like Andravati, I am an early modernist, and my work focuses on the impact of intellectual, cultural, and religious forces on early modern military, political, and diplomatic history with a particular focus on Central and Northern Europe. So that is our panel. So we can now move on to our lightning round. Remember, lightning means quick and brief. Our lightning round of discussing our three um, broad themes or questions. Now, in the preliminary discussions this group held building up to the round table, each of us started out a little squeamish to really own up to being a diplomatic historian. And we all offered caveats regarding our relations to diplomatic history, saying, well, I don't exactly do that, or I sort of do this. Um, and we also noted um, that by this point, the new diplomatic history, the ostensible um, subject of our panel, is by now a few decades old or rather is new in only a way that historians could, could love and call new. So we decided to take both of these matters on directly in the very first of the questions that we'll briefly discuss in our round. And that first question is, what is diplomatic history to you? So what does each of us mean when we think of diplomatic history and what is new in it? So that is our first question and I will turn the floor to each of my panelists, my co-panelists, in sequence for um, a couple minutes of conversation of that question. So Nicola, you're first. Thank you very much, Dan, for, uh, and Indravati for uh, inviting me to join this uh, panel on new diplomatic history. 
And uh, yes, I have several caveats as to whether I am a diplomatic historian or not. I think not. But in any case, I am a historian of ancient and up to uh, pre-modern East Asia. And my main field of research, as Dan said, is the uh, history of the relations between <clears throat> China and non-Chinese inner Asian people. And if you don't mind, I will quickly share my screen to show a map that may be useful. Um, so here is China that I'm marking it here with my pointer and uh, uh, cursor. And then this is the greater step wall, the inner Asian wall. So the relations between these two very, very uh, different uh, cultural, uh, political, and, and economic worlds forms a, a critical aspect of East Asian history for um, over two millennia, really. Understanding how these two worlds communicated is at the core of my work. And of course, diplomacy plays a very important role, although the information we have is uh, somehow uh, lopsided uh, in, uh, in the sense that on, we mostly have the Chinese version of it, the Chinese narrative, because China was a literate civilization and the uh, nomadic step wall largely was not. So the challenge is really to understand how uh, these people established a common ground, a level of communication. How did they actually communicate with each other? And of course, diplomacy uh, was a, a fundamental um, aspect of uh, the of trade was another aspect, but diplomatic relations were, were really critical. And of course, the strategies, how did they build their own strat strategies for uh, diplomatic relations? So if we want to answer what is diplomatic history to me and what is new in it, well, perhaps the most important thing is to see how in a pre-modern East Asian context, we can use diplomatic history to expand our uh, angle of vision and to include a number of actors in this history of diplomatic exchanges. And this would be my first point in you know, diplomatic history or new diplomatic history does extend the concept of diplomatic exchange to a multiplicity of actors and also expands the uh, uh, range of sources that we can use. And by actors, I mean religious fig figures such as missionaries, for instance, merchants, brides, I mean, diplomatic marriages, of course, are an important uh, part of diplomacy, interpreters, artists and musicians, war prisoners, defectors, hostages. These are just some of the, what I would call the vectors of diplomacy uh, and that, that uh, are engaged in informal exchanges. Uh, between these two very separate, uh, culturally different uh, worlds. A second aspect is to explore cultural traits that emerge during diplomatic exchanges, but are not exclusive to diplomacy. And by that, I mean, and, and sorry, uh, ritual performance and normative aspects, political language, kinship relation and material culture, all of these aspects inform to a certain degree cultural exchanges, but also inform diplomatic, diplomatic relations. And uh, of course, um, in, in the, in the pre-modern world, uh, each of these uh, uh, aspects have its own, has its own uh, specific uh, features. Um, I would like to uh, underscore, for instance, the importance of ritual performance when, when um, Chinese diplomats went over to uh, talk to nomads, they had to perform in a certain way as in order to be accepted. So access to the uh, ruler, to the emperor, to the king on the other side required certain knowledge of, uh, of, of, of uh, um, the other person's culture that of course uh, was acquired uh, only with some, with, some, with some effort. So how did they acquire the knowledge uh, also um, represents an important aspect of this exchange. And finally, uh, 
I would like also, normally we have this, uh, this, this idea that, that China dominated the diplomatic world that, that with, the, with the concept of tribute relations, for instance, uh, all the, a number of countries paid tribute to China, China set the rules. Um, but, but in East Asia, we also have diplomatic relations that did not involve China. And so uh, we're, let's say, less asymmetric, perhaps, we're more egalitarian. Uh, I could define them as non-tributary relations. Uh, also, diplomacy existed at a sub-state level, where we have um, uh, um, interesting, uh, interesting questions re regarding legal standing and legal rights for these sub-state actors, like, let's say, tribes or, or other types of polities. And then we have a number of non-state rituals that were performed by people outside, let's say, the cultural sphere of China who did not have to conform to uh, diplomatic rules dictated by what was the superpower for most of this time, which was uh, China. So all of these aspects are really new, could be new contributions to the diplomatic history of East Asia and especially to the uh, ancient, uh, uh, ancient world. I will stop here because I think I have taken already my time and stop sharing my screen. Thanks very, very much. Um, well, my squeamishness that Dan mentioned is going to be very much in order here. Um, and I guess I'd just say at the outset that from the, for the years of a 20th century Americanist, the notion of new diplomatic history is something of an oxymoron. Uh, and to do this, I'll stick to type and go historically. Um, and note, of course, I'm painting in very broad brushstrokes. But when I entered um, the field, I started graduate school in 1991, diplomatic history in the United States was primarily the history of modern diplomacy. My main scholarly organization then is now was the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, Schaefer to Aficionados, which sponsored a journal called, shockingly, Diplomatic History. Uh, not too long before I started subscribing, the journal actually had an eagle on the cover for about 10 years. What does this say about the field? The field was American-centered, as the association name uh, indicated. It was exclusively or almost exclusively US-based with a handful of English speakers, mostly from Western Europe. Uh, the topics were like the Cold War itself, as it was seen then, centered around Europe, and when countries beyond the North Atlantic appeared, there were often stages upon which battles, literal as well as historiographic, took place. The central explanandum was U.S. foreign relations, which was not just explained, but evaluated, even close to graded at times. Uh, the source base was government archives, the network of presidential libraries and bustling intellectual hubs like Abilene, Kansas, West Branch, Iowa, and Independence, Missouri, Missouri as well as, of course, the Mothership uh, National Archives, first in Washington and then uh, later in College Park, Maryland. The field in its, this form still set itself in explicit opposition to what the organization's founders saw as their own marginalization in the 1970s and 1980s in the wake of the revolutions of social and cultural history that had been reshaping US-based history departments. Uh, the field housed many who took a sharply critical st stance regarding US foreign policy, as well as others who defended it, but the field was partisan in the sense that scholarly debates closely replicated, at times they actually even repeated, uh, the arguments of their historical subjects. Yet but by the early 90s, just as I was entering, things were changing. Uh, the end of the Cold War, combined with other factors, uh, allowed for the beginning of something new. And I'd suggest here that over the next decade, uh, things moved in three different directions. And I'm actually struck by the parallels uh, to Nicola's uh, new directions, even though uh, we're going across millennia and many miles. The first, uh, first direction of the new scholarship in the 90s was our, uh, new archival openings. Glasnost, if it, as it were, came to US diplomatic history in the boom years of the early 90s. And I still recall the kind of shiver of excitement, reading documents from Soviet archives stamped with Sivershena Sikretna, top secret, that had been hidden for so long. And now the thought was we have really have the answers. But basically we were answering old questions with new sources. A second move was internationalization, a discovery, if you will, of the world beyond the North Atlantic, still focused on state-to-state -state relations, still using state records, but a wider set of geographic actors. And the final stage, uh, the third, I should say, these are all um, simultaneous, uh, was still kind of amorphous at this moment, but it was, I would say, the introduction of topics and methods from social and cultural history and from American studies. The field saw special issues on religion, on cultural aspects of international relations, on 
women and gender, uh, et cetera. These initial forays were preliminary, but very exciting interrogations of actually what constituted diplomacy or more broadly foreign relations. We could look beyond uh, presidential libraries and presidential records and other elements of society and other forms of US engagement with the world, topics that went beyond uh, diplomacy, strictly speaking. Though they tended to rely exclusively, uh, heavily, if not exclusively on US sources, they employed new methods to examine new phenomena, new sources. To fast forward to the present, the second and third modes, uh, interrogation and uh, internationalization have been proceeding simultaneously, if not always compatibly since the 90s. The turn toward internationalizing American history, the origins had of which had very little to do with our field, gave shape for a new intellectual energy, new interlocutors and plenty of new recruits, but basically did so in direct opposition to the study of diplomatic history uh, formally constituted. And so again, to the era of a 20th century Americanist, new dip diplomatic history is a strange term, perhaps even a contradiction uh, in terms right up there with the famous George Carlin routine about jumbo shrimp. Uh, to this conclusion that this is all contradictory would be mistaken, but I'll have to save that for round two, uh, where we can talk about what a new diplomatic history could in fact do for much of my field, uh, and it indeed already is, thanks. Andrew Okay, <laughs> thank you. So uh, this is a very difficult question because answering it can lead to unintentionally narrowing the field. And at the same time, it can give the impression that one wishes to assert a monopoly over it. So uh, maybe I would start by saying that my answer would be very personal and intimately linked to my experience as a researcher in history and to the way I learned this profession and I still learn it. Uh, when I was a master's student, I saw diplomatic history as a field of study determined by an obvious body of sources. I knew that I would have to read diplomatic treaties, diplomatic correspondences, and so on. And to me, a good diplomatic history had to be the analysis of these sources in the broader context of international relations. So it was also like a modern Americanist, uh, the very classical way founded by the series of sources edited in the 19th century, for example, in France, where we have this series, Recueil des Instructions Données aux Ambassadeurs et Ministres de France. So this collection of instructions given to uh, ambassadors and that very much structured the field for decades. And I must confess, uh, of it was uh, okay with me <laughs> to do that kind of history. And I must confess that I was very disappointed when I first encountered the archives. Uh, I had go gone to Germany in order to study the relations between France and German princes in the 17th and 18th centuries, a time of great wars, of peace congresses, and eventually of diplomatic revolution with we the 15th France making an alliance with the Holy Roman Empire and all I found in the diplomatic correspondences just did not match with what I had expected. Almost 80% of those letters did not deal with the great political issues of the time, but more with topics I tended to consider or to regard as peripheral. Above all, uh, with the personal situations of the diplomats involved in the negotiations, uh, their letters were filled with complaints about their financial situation and even about their physical and psychological health. Many of them were in debt, complaining about the high cost of living in a city like Paris. And one of the diplomats even explained, since he, since he could not longer invite anyone to his home because of the lack of money, he was thinking of committing suicide by throwing himself in the Seine. Another one told the minister in Paris used uh, uh, used to tell the minister in Paris uh, all the gossip he could glean about the court where he was posted. But after this first disappointment, I became more and more interested in this part of the sources, setting myself the challenge of linking these elements to the great plot of international relations. And in this sense, uh, I think that I am both a child of this time where the new diplomatic history was born, and I hope now a representative of it. 
It is a history that does not consider the field of politics as separate from other fields that make up life, make up life, uh, economy, passion, disease, and so on. And indeed, uh, what is new in diplomatic history for me is that shift of perspectives and also the change of scales that this history makes possible. And here it should be noted that, the, as uh, Dan said and um, in the introduction, uh, that the new diplomatic history is already quite old. Uh, it is nearly maybe 40, 30 years old. In France, for instance, it really started with Lucien Belli's work on spies and ambassadors published in 1992. But during the last decades, diplomatic history has proven its great flexibility and its ability to conquer new territories and new bodies of sources also. So that will be the second part then, what can diplomatic history do for you, even if you, are, you do not consider yourself a diplomatic historian. But what is remarkable in works related to the history of diplomacy today is this back and forth between the micro level, that is the individual or the local level, and the international or even global level, facing through the national stage, which is thus reduced to an intermediary rank, intermediate rank. So in this respect, the new diplomatic history has largely contribu contributed to the renewal of political history in general. And to this, I rejoin uh, what David and Nicolas say. Well, thank you all for being here and I'll be brief with my remarks. Um, to the question, uh, what is this history uh, to me and what is new in it? Um, so I work, I focus on uh, Ghana in the 1950s and 60s and Ghana civil relations in particular. And so while I haven't thought of myself as a diplomatic historian, my work very much lent itself to this field. And what is it for me? In many cases, I've understood it to be um, that in the, their interactions between states and how states interact via the presidents, via diplomats, and other state officials. But this diplomatic history, the idea of diplomacy implies a sort of agency, the ability uh, to actually negotiate in one's own terms, which in African history for African states uh, leaving independence, sorry, leaving close to independence, this sort of agency has been absent. Uh, African states, and as David Engelman has pointed out, but a history tended to be and has been, right, US foreign policy, but to expand it, uh, the, the um, global north's foreign policy towards Africa. Um, so what is new for me is the hope that um, African states, African peoples, we can look at their archives, their documents, which exist to see how the, the worst of the world fits in within the African foreign policy um, perspective. Regarding actors, um, my work in particular looks past uh, the leaders, I do look into leaders, also to the students. Um, to the many Ghanaian African students who lived abroad and who directly were engaging in diplomacy uh, through their lives with the foreign states and actors that they engaged with. Um, I really like, um, 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 Nicola's framing of ritual performance in regards to diplomatic history. And one of the ritual performances uh, I often noted, noticed in the 1960s is when foreign leaders, particularly Soviets, write to African leaders, they engage in these three ritual practices. One is anti-imperialism. That's ritual performance that they always, uh, always discuss, including anti-American, uh, ideas and anti-colonialism. This was a ritual in almost every document between African leaders and the Soviets. And similarly, when Africans wrote to the Soviets, oftentimes anti-nuclear weapons, anti-imperialism, and this push. So these sort of ritual performances, which Nicola was talking about uh, 500 years ago, are, were still active in the 1960s and played key roles uh, in it. And lastly, what is it for me? Um, is to think about it 
thinking about African diplomacy outside the Cold War boundary that exists within who want to white supremacy. And I'll think about that and I'll talk about that later on in the next rounds. Thank you and thanks to all four of you for such um, fruitful and provocative comments. It's the, the, the task of, of, of my coming last um, alphabetically in this round means that everyone's already said all of the good stuff first. Um, so I'll do my best to, to add something uh, and, and I'll be very brief in doing so. Um, the question of what is diplomatic history to me, um, it's gonna echo much of what we've already heard, but it's, it's studying the, the whole set of actors and actions involved in forming and servicing relationships across recognized lines of division and difference. And really taking that whole set as the key part, looking at everything that goes into form is forming and servicing relationships across recognized lines of division and difference. Um, and it also involves fascinating questions of representation, questions of individuals or groups representing in a, in a direct sense in some cases, but also acting on behalf of entities larger than themselves. Um, so how do individuals and groups act upon behalf of something larger than themselves in order to form and service relationships um, among the recognizably different? That I think is a fascinating question that really unites all five of our work, uh, very different time periods, very different parts of the world. I think we all deal with, with those kinds of questions. Now, like my colleagues, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit historically about how we got to where we are. We all, we all did this. Um, and, and to me, the, the, the new diplomatic history is, is a process of, of opening up, of modernizing and theorizing a field that had not needed to do any of those three until that point. Um, blurring the lines between official and unofficial activity, between formal and informal diplomacy. Um, today, I don't think anyone would be surprised if we were asked to list the, the players on a global stage or the players on an international stage, if those were not all governmental entities, if we had Microsoft or OPEC or Greenpeace or Al Qaeda or Bono or whoever it might be or whatever it might be as, as, as participants in forming relationships and conditioning those relationships. Um, unfortunately, that's often written about as if this was some kind of unique condition of post-modernity, that we've somehow gotten to this point. And I think the reality is each of us could attest is that that's been the case all along in different ways. Um, that the plurality of actors is something that is not new, but rather something that we're coming to recognize um, and, and appreciate um, across time. And that actions not traditionally coded as diplomatic indeed serve the roles of, of, of diplomacy. And this is another thing a number of my colleagues brought up. I think the development of the field has been very Hegelian. Um, that we started out as the privileged children of Rankian positivist historiography. Um, and we were very slow to respond to broader innovation in the field and even beyond our field, broader innovation in the academy. That for a long time, history was basically coterminous with diplomatic and political history and military history. Um, and that um, this is something baked into the very DNA of, of, our, of our discipline. Um, the founding of diplomatic history is coterminous with the founding of history as a professional academic discipline, um, which was founded notably by scholars who were themselves in the 19th century deeply personally implicated in the 19th century nationalist project, who were obsessed to the point of fetishizing official state archives as the repositories of more or less um, straightforward empirical truth, an empirical truth that just so happened to affirm the centrality of the state and the national categories that these individuals were advocating for in their non-academic capacities. Um, so it's baked into our, 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 our DNA in a methodological way, and this would be the larger point I get to in a moment. Um, now what happened, as, as a number of my colleagues have alluded to, um, is that with the social history turn of the 1960s and the linguistic turn of the 1970s, um, that diplomatic history was very slow to react and was also the ideal punching bag for those who were embracing the, the new and the innovative um, directions. Um, this was seen, this is the arch conservative field of great man top-down history, um, located purely in state archives, um, theoretically innocent of, of any sophistication. Um, and for a while, I think there, the, the field was, was, was sort of down um, in, in reputation as well as in, in sort of activity. 
Um, the rehabilitation with the new diplomatic history of the 1990s in some ways swung in a classically Hegelian direction um, from thesis almost to antithesis. Um, and this gets to one of, my, one of the points I hope to make, um, which is that much of the new diplomatic history at first, and even now still, um, tries to issue the traditional questions of state activity, of power, of, um, of, of treaties and wars and the kinds of things that, that are often assumed to be the, the, the bread and butter of, of diplomatic history. Um, in other words, by swinging in an almost completely cultural direction, um, scholars tended to throw out the, the, the baby with the bathwater, in this case, the traditionally diplomatic baby with the new. The new part was embraced, the diplomatic part was sort of, was sort of distanced. And I think this is one of the ways in which, and we'll get to this later, um, one of the ways in which um, I hope the field will continue to move, um, which is returning to many of these traditional questions of, of power, of politics, of relationships on the, on the grand scale, um, but doing so from the substantially improved broader lens, theoretically and otherwise, that we've come to gain through our embrace of interdisciplinarity, our embrace of the advances of our social and cultural historian brethren, of, of all the, the expanding the, the, the lens to include actors who otherwise would have been excluded. Um, so the return of the state through a better contextualized and theoretically richer perspective, which to me is a fundamentally methodological question. Um, it's a question of what we consider to be the natural units of analysis, um, the relevant containers within which our material occurs. Um, that it's no longer only the state, but the state is also hopefully getting back into, into the conversation as part of that um, much more interesting and much more plural and much more diverse um, field. Okay, so that was um, round one, our first question. What is diplomatic history to you and what is new in it? We'll move then back through for another round of discussion. Um, and this is question number two. What can dip diplomatic history do for you? Or why should the broader field, the broader profession, and the broader academy care about what we do? Okay, the floor is back to Nicola. Thank you very much, Dan. So um, the answer to the question, what can diplomatic history do for you, for me is fairly straightforward and I guess deceptively simple. And that is that uh, diplomatic uh, history uh, for me, it really generates new questions. This is what is important for me, new questions that can help us understand how two different, uh, um, th these two different worlds that I've uh, mentioned before, these two different uh, um, cultures can build tools to communicate uh, from each other and to learn how to establish or to uh, create this common ground where they can meet and, uh, and negotiate. So um, really, uh, methodologically, if you like, the challenge is to merge history and anthropology, uh, because uh, a large side of this question is, uh, is anthropological. And um, there was a question actually by Lorena Chambers, uh, who asked me whether uh, uh, my definition of new diplomatic history is like cultural diplomacy. And certainly this, uh, this is one aspect of it, but I would also say that um, diplomacy is part of cultural history, if you like. I mean, it should not be limited to, the, to military and political history. I'll share my screen once more just to illustrate um, uh, the uh, question of uh, um, how I see, uh, just one second, um, this new, new slide. Um, so uh, and this, uh, this merging of uh, history and anthropology, how can we do it? And, you know, I, I'd like to focus just for a moment on a focal point of uh, diplomatic exchange for, for the period, uh, um, the long period and the, and the part of the world that I deal with, uh, which is the gift. The gift is, 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 is as I said, a focal central uh, item in diplomatic exchange. But what, can, what, 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 is, what is a gift? And I mean, it can be a tribute. This is just a simple list. A tribute, a required payment from one polity to another uh, as, uh, as a result of a political arrangement. It could be an homage, a public show of respect, usually to gain access. Uh, to a, it could be a commercial item. 
um, a lot of diplomatic relations are really uh, an excuse to establish economic relations. So there are all of these different, different aspects. And I'm especially interested in individuals as gifts. Uh, individuals such as brides, but not just brides, um, there was a famous uh, princess, uh, this Wenchen Kunju, who was sent as a young bride to Tibet. Well, she has a whole retinue of, uh, of uh, artists and other uh, um, uh, specialists in various, uh, in various visual arts, um, but also Buddhist monks. Uh, she was considered to be the person who introduced Buddhism to Tibet architects. They built temples and so forth. So a major vector of cultural influence. And she herself was considered to be extremely gifted. So gifted in more than one sense, in one sense, uh, we, we can say. So these individuals who are sent as gifts include, uh, uh, include scientists, include scholars, include animal trainers. I mean, we understand that hunting was a major feature of court culture. So you, you have a very, very large range of people who uh, um, uh, are involved in these diplomatic exchanges and can tell us what is valued, what is the value system within a particular, uh, particular setting. And of course, the, 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 the gift is some kind of a, of a door that tells us uh, uh, a number of things about the uh, power relations between the two different uh, entities, two different polities, both the political and military dimensions, but not just that. We can also look at the cultural norms that, of course, are negotiated between, between the two sides and the world order, order uh, ideology that dominates these exchanges. So uh, looking at the quality, frequency, reciprocity of the gifts, we can discover a number of issues that otherwise we would remain somehow uh, um, uh, not, not explicit or not revealed. Um, so for me, diplomatic history is really a, a generator of new questions and new ideas that can, can uh, expand the range of, uh, of our understanding of this uh, of, of, uh, um, cultural encounters, let's say. And of course, the Silk Road is very rich, uh, offers an extremely rich material in that respect. I, I'll, I'll stop here. I'll stop sharing just one second. There you go. Great. Um, well, I'll take the second question actually in a bit of a different way than uh, Nicola did. Uh, what can diplomatic history do for you? And I'll actually frame it really around the second person plural. What, can, not, what will diplomatic history do for me, but what will it do for us? First person plural, excuse me. Um, and I'm confident uh, that these approaches can work because in fact, all these approaches are already uh, in play and that we, could, uh, we can already see what diplomatic history is doing for us here. And I've, I think four, depending how you count, four or five um, different ways in which uh, so we're benefiting from uh, this efflorescence of interest in, in diplomatic history. For, and again, this focused on 20th century international history. First, I'd say that it allows historians to explore the anatomy and physiology, that is the structure and the operations of global power over the course of the 20th century. We can see more clearly the interactions of economic, military, political power uh, in a tumultuous century that's full of different power, uh, of power full of power differentials that took uh, radically different forms at different times. Secondly, the sort of new diplomatic history, I think, can offer a useful census of the changing loci of power, the rise of international organizations from the United Nations and its umbre uh, umbrella um, to international financial institutions, non-governmental agencies, private firms, and of course, the changing nature of state power in different settings. So for Americanists in particular, but really for all international historians, we can deepen our understanding of how state power functions in relationship um, to an international system that's composed of many different elements. Third, I think that the, um, the new diplomatic history can place the state in the context of other vectors of US power of other forms of foreign relations. And there's uh, a lot of work happening and even more I think still to be done in this dimension. Uh, corporate power uh, has received some attention. Higher education has not received enough. It's actually one of America's largest uh, 
imp, uh, exports, excuse me, in economic terms, uh, but also um, uh, but also with the kind of cultural and intellectual um, relevance far beyond that. Uh, uh, NGOs, both uh, nation-based NGOs and this sort of international, internationally oriented NGOs, all kinds of cultural and literary productions, all of these are vectors of, um, of US power. And then of course, there's uh, reckoning with the flows of people ranging from emigration, immigration to tourism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and finally, and far from last in all this is, uh, is consumption. Consumption is a, is a vector of US power. Uh, all of these, I think, matter in important ways that contextualize state power. They don't reduce it, they don't minimize it, they don't eliminate it, but contextualize the role of state power amid many other um, uh, vectors of national power. And finally, following on Travati, I'd say that the new diplomatic history allows us to undertake kind of cultural, political, personal readings of all kinds of uh, of different foreign relations, uh, even even sort of the narrowly diplomatic ones are really uh, open to uh, and indeed crying out for uh, more careful uh, kind of cultural readings of, of their impact. And I think we can see uh, this um, these different directions operating uh, around the field and around the world. I'm focusing my remarks on the United States, but it's hardly just uh, just Americanists uh, studying Americans who uh, who are part of this. Kind of expansion of the different, uh, studying the different forms uh, of state power and the forms of cultural power that um, relate, uh, but are not beholden to state power. And I'll leave off there. Thanks. So um, I think maybe we can begin with uh, concepts because uh, Daniel talked about theories and um, I think uh, diplom diplomacy is a very relevant indicator of how societies at different times define politics and power. For early modern Europe, uh, diplomatic practices and the implicit or express hierarchies that underlie them allow us to understand how the continent moves from a certain pluralism where cities, convents, monarchies could negotiate at the same table to a more restricted vision of the state. In parallel with the progressive imposition of sovereignty as the only criterion for participation in what we call today diplomacy, but uh, that was called um, until the French Revolution negotiation. The word diplomacy wasn't even, even used. So uh, the admission in the club of actors of negotiation was concepts, consubstantial to the constitution of the essence of politics in early modern Europe. And um, this uh, ontologi ontological function of diplomacy, so uh, let us uh, see diplomacy as a way for small, weak, or even non-state powers to continue to perform a political identity that gives them access to certain resources despite the changes in the law of nation and diplomatic conventions since the 17th century. They can um, have a status, a voice in the concert of nations, an identity, um, an identity that the rulers can display not only towards foreign powers, powers but also an identity that they can display um, to their domestic interlocutors when these challenge their legitimacy. And that's also an important insight of diplomatic history. You can reread the um, uh, relations in the bodies that make diplomacy. And by carefully following, following these directions, we can better interpret terms. For the early modern era, for example, uh, diplomatic encounters between the four parts of the world go through intense and quite rapid changes which makes diplomatic history a crucial approach in order to apprehend the way global relationships and world hierarchies are established. Because what Nana talked about in his um, first report response, um, that you can absolutely not observe in the 16th century in the relationship with African kings and societies. And um, to this respect, um, diplomatic history can help to understand how new groups or new powers were able to establish themselves and how old ones disappeared 
which nuances the vision of international relations based solely on force. Of course, uh, one should not have an ironic uh, view of diplomacy. Um, uh, uh, its uh, hushed conventions are often used to impose power relations, uh, commercial monopolies, uh, in, especially in the early modern context of uh, the early European expansion. But it also tells a non-teleological story where power relations are not static but can change, are the fruit of mental constructions, of performance, rituals, as well as power struggles. So uh, diplomatic history, what can it do for us? It also teaches us to be attentive to the possibilities and room for maneuver of sometimes unexpected groups which do not fit into the patterns defined by the traditional history of international relations as it was, found, was founded in the 19th century. Yeah, for me, um, thematic history for me is a political project in regard to African history. Um, because as many, all of you here know, African history as a field within our discipline has been unfortunately uh, marginalized um, for various reasons, one, one being racial. And African history has been written has almost steered away from diplomatic history because of lack of sources and other things. So for me, my, what, can the, what can it do for me is to show that African history can exist in this sphere of hierarchy in the field um, as Africans, African states um, do produce sources. They are key players in international affairs. Um, there are two wonderful books, which they, which I'm going to assume that the authors themselves don't think of themselves as engaged in diplomatic history, but these are brilliant texts in it. One is um, Abna Ose Osari's book called um, Atomic Junction, and the other is uh, Benjamin Talton's book in the Land of Plenty. These two texts show how uh, Black people, Black leaders, Black thinkers were engaged in global and international diplomatic efforts to change the plight and uh, state of the, our, their countries and the world. Um, but these thinkers wouldn't call their texts diplomatic history. So for me, calling a diplomatic history is, is part of a political project uh, to bring African history into these conversations. Um, two, in thinking about diplomatic history and what it can do for us is to reclaim African agency, um, is to reclaim the roles Africans played in shaping the world. Um, and so that's what diplomatic history is doing for me. And the term of it, because of its uh, history in our field, brings a sense of legitimacy to it that there are sources, it is a positive uh, sense of history, but I will ex explain in the next round uh, how this also goes beyond our um, traditional um, high level diplomatic sources and how local people and local Africans in various parts are engaged in diplomatic history and how we can look at them to rethink the field in general. Great, thank you again, everyone. I see that we're running a little long, so I will keep myself brief and I will ask everyone in round three to, to keep um, him or herself also brief. So we'll have time to field some of the questions that have come in. So what can diplomatic history do for us? Why should the broader field or profession or academy care? Um, a couple quick notes. I think that diplomatic history is a magnificent case study in complexity. Um, and the, the rough edges between contingency and structure. I think they come together magnificently um, through looking at diplomatic history. And I think that scholars of, of, of all fields of history can benefit from that. Um, border construction and border crossing. Um, diplomatic history, again, is simultaneously a history of difference and a history of trying to find some way to overcome that difference, um, to overcome a certain kind of alienation. Um, not always with peaceful intentions by any means, but with the desire to have some form of interaction there. So that I think is, is, is an important lesson that we can have. Diplomatic history is the probing of relations and the assumed distinctions between the public and the private. 
um, things that interest historians of, of all different fields. Um, I think each of my colleagues has commented upon that in, in, their, in, their, um, in their comments in different ways. Um, these are central issues um, that diplomatic history can get to. Diplomatic history, as I mentioned before um, in, in my last comments, I, I think is, a, um, is, is also a, a, a privileged perspective from which to see not just the potentialities, but the limitations of political power, um, the limitations of governance, the limitations of, of central control. I'm sure each of us in our studies have seen the, the, the delegated representative who went off and did something quite different than um, than had been um, they, than that person had been directed to, um, and these are in some ways not just the exceptions, but this is this is a story of of efforts uh, to project power in different ways, um, and how diplomatic history shows not just the successes of those, but I would say especially the limitations upon efforts to to project power. And finally, um, diplomatic history is also um, remarkably ecumenical because the diplomatic archive is remarkably ecumenical. Um, that diplomats are above all else information professionals. Their job is to gather information and report it. Um, and in many cases, they are ordered quite stringently to gather every last bit and scrap of information they can get their hands on and convey this. Which means that scholars of almost any historical question are going to find something in the diplomatic archives that will be relevant to what they're interested in. Um, and here I refer um, to the work um, of, of Mary Lindemann, um, the president of the HA just this past year, 2020, in some ways the, the founder of the feast today, if, if we can immodestly refer to ourselves as a feast, um, in that she, um, she was the motive force behind organizing this, this round table. And she is, I think, quite incisively written about um, what she calls the discrete charm of the diplomatic archive for historians of virtually all subfields um, and not just politics and not just um, sort of large scale economics, but historians of, of culture, of gender, of medicine, of science, of intellectual history, of the family, of, of almost every, every different form. Um, including many subfields that might themselves seem constitutionally allergic to the traditional top-down great man form of history that diplomatic history is often posited as being. Um, so I would um, think that we as historians who study these things have quite a bit to speak about with um, our colleagues in these other fields. And I would encourage them to, um, to equally pay attention to, um, if not to us, um, to the archives that we often visit because they will find things in those archives that are relevant to what they wish to study as well. Okay, so with that, and again, with the um, admonition to please keep ourselves um, brief enough that we will have time to field some of the questions that have come in and welcome other questions from um, our audience. Again, place those questions in the Q&A function if you have them, please, and we will get to them after this third round. This is our final brief lightning, lightning third round, which is how does one do diplomatic history? What are the questions we ask and how do we seek to answer them? So a fundamentally methodological kind of question. Um, with that, we'll return to, to Nicola. Thank you. Um, there are so many things that have been said um, that it's impossible to react to, to, to all of them. Um, so I will just go to the methodological part and uh, once again, uh, share uh, a slide so that I can be really, really brief about this. Um, so how do, how do I do? Um, and I, I, again, I have no intention of being normative about this. How do um, I do diplomatic history or what diplomatic history does for me? Um, so to me, diplomatic history is I mean, I conceive it as a sort of a micro history of the cultural encounter, keeping in mind that I don't have large diplomatic archives to access. So it's always a question of putting together very different and uh, um, heterogeneous uh, uh, sources. So looking at, the, at, at this micro history of the cultural encounter, um, uh, which is a sort of, uh, uh, represented by the uh, diplomatic uh, relationship. 
um, we can look at diplomacy's deep context. Uh, that is, for me, really how people look for a common ground. Um, since we cannot assume the existence of common norms between separate cultural spheres. So what lies behind a diplomatic encounter and how do we find out? Then uh, we come to the question of the, the ethnography, what I call the ethnography of, uh, of diplomacy. That is, uh, how is uh, uh, this encounter enacted and by whom? And especially who sets the rules? Um, this is a critical part of, the, of diplomacy, I guess. Um, also, there is a political culture of diplomacy that is uh, what, um, uh, not just what diplomacy, uh, what is diplomacy for, but what is diplomacy about? Uh, the, the expectations, what are we uh, uh, trying to sort out when we have a, a diplomatic encounter? And in terms of method, I try to integrate, as I said, many different aspects. I look at archaeology, for instance, the material aspects could be the setting, could be also the value systems embedded in objects and, uh, as I said before, gifts. There is a visual aspect of ritual performance. Uh, there are a beautiful, beautiful um, uh, uh, artistic representation of diplomatic relations, for instance, in which we can see that uh, the diplomats are identified by sp specific uh, clothes or dresses or, or hairdo and so on, physical features, in other words, that have uh, ethnographic value. And then I also rely on comparative analysis, that is, different contexts in which cultural features can be seen as shared, borrowed, or, or mimicked. And, uh, and that really does, uh, does help um, set some kind, of, um, uh, some kind of framework through which we can, uh, we can compare different, um, uh, different cultural attitudes towards diplomacy. I will stop here, so very briefly. Uh, this should be an easy question, uh, but I actually find it hard because there's actually so many different important and intellectually enriching ways to do diplomatic history, and I'm kind of a big tent person. But let me just mention two and then make one note about sources, uh, which has come up already a number of times. I mean, I would suggest as an overarching rubric, uh, historians could do well to deepen our explorations of inequality uh, in, in a global context, just as inequality takes multiple forms, operates on multiple scales, a new diplomatic history could uh, already is, in fact, explore the way that relations between nations reflect, refract, reinforce, uh, even create forms of inequality happening at local, national, regional, and global levels. Uh, and this could include, of course, economic inequality, racial, ethnic, national inequalities, um, uh, mechanisms of inclusion and exclusion, et cetera. A second topic, uh, not completely distinct from the first, is studies of sovereignty here. Um, building on what Andravati had said. Um, it's a core trend, I think, of 20th century international system uh, was the demise under great pressure from below of a world defined by empires and its uneven uh, replacement by a world defined by states. But invocations of sovereignty didn't end with the creation of states out of these colonies, uh, thanks in large part to imperial map making that either ignored or intentionally stoked ethno-linguistic and religious differences battles for sovereignty continued long after European colonizers departed. Um, notably, we can see the um, secession of Bangladesh from, uh, from Pakistan in 1971, but there are uh, plenty of other uh, movements for autonomy or uh, for, uh, within or independence from post-colonial states. And sovereignty, of course, became a rallying cry well beyond issues of territory. It entered the 20th century lexicon in po purely political terms, exclusive uh, control over defined territory, but activists and national leaders alike expanded sovereignty to incorporate resource sovereignty, economic sovereignty, uh, and so on. Um, a note about sources here. Uh, we need new sources. We also need a uh, new way of interrogating those sources. Uh, as I mentioned, when I entered, entered the field, diplomatic history was essentially energized by new troves of declassified sources. And I can't resist here just putting in a plug for efforts by the AHA, among others, to lobby US government agencies for declassification. In other words, to ask official bodies to obey the laws governing their operations. Now, a new diplomatic history should, and indeed already does, engage in new readings of these documents attuned to cultural conceptions, to hidden assumptions, to, um, uh, to operations of power within the documents. Uh, and, and to do so, it should draw on the kind of range of methodological inspirations that have already come up. 
Finally, is, a, is a, an issue, uh, or even two issues that perhaps um, are particular to the problems of the uh, particular problems of the late 20th century, maybe the polar opposite, of the kinds of issues that uh, Nicola and his uh, colleagues uh, face, which is the increasing scale of documentation where foreign policy formation in one country could generate millions of pages of documentation per year while in other countries actually practically nothing is made available. Does not that doesn't exist, it's just not made available. Um, we need to consciously work out a way to deal with a highly uneven picture, what uh, Nicola called the lopsidedness uh, of, um, uh, of the archive, a surfeit of materials in some places and shortages in others, a pattern which of course may reflect other forms uh, of difference and inequality. And I think I'll end there, thanks. Okay, so um, I will try to make it brief. Um, three questions mainly, maybe. Uh, if, what for, and how? <laughs> so uh, to begin with the if, um, for example, I'm currently working on the diplomacy of the Holy Roman Empire, and this is quite, quite an interesting actor because it's a subaltern in the history, historiography of empires. It is an empire without colonies, whose sovereignty is challenged uh, during the whole uh, early modern era. And um, it, there is a second problem with this um, Holy Roman Empire. Uh, does it make diplomacy? Do empires actually make diplomacy? Do they negotiate with others? Um, here we are, we are at the crossroads of uh, two important subject fields, maybe. Uh, on the one hand, the imperial history, and on the other hand, the methods pro provided by diplomatic history. The imperial history tends to isolate empires from other political formations uh, of the same period. It tends to con consider that empires have a conquering approach towards what is different from them. And the conclusion to be drawn from this would logically be the absence of diplomatic relations. But we know, thanks to uh, the many, many works in the imperial turn, um, that improvisation, awareness of their own fragility were at the very core of the functioning of empires. And this awareness provided room for interaction and negotiation with others. So, uh, here and here uh, comes a moment when one must be very careful in characterizing what is truly diplomatic, because in those empires you have many actors that get into negotiations. So um, can any type of negotiation be designated as such? I think that's a very important question. It's very difficult to answer this question. Which kind of negotiation is a diplomatic negotiation? And uh, to us, it is really challenging because uh, we don't have uh, even have the vocabulary in the early modern era. So we don't have the word diplomacy or diplomat. And now the second question, uh, what for? What is at stake in a negotiation? What do the different sides negotiate? Is it the interest of a state, of a group, of the di or is it the diplomat's own interest? And uh, is it all that at the same time? And uh, last uh, question, how do you negotiate in a diplomatic setting? Do the actors share conventions that help them to find common ground as uh, uh, we said at the beginning, or at least uh, to create an impression of a common ground that make them able to engage with another? And here we have all the uh, questions of min misunderstanding and cultural difference and so on. And uh, by searching for moments of communication that are embedded in something we could call uh, conventions. And here, as Nicola said, uh, who sets the rules? Uh, you can ask questions that are crucial to diplomatic history. So uh, to, by bringing those different sets of questions together, I think it's possible to create one's personal cluster of clues. Uh, which draws on one's own sensi sensitivity and personal interests. So you can draw on sociology or on the connected history or on uh, the system theory. And that uh, allows the construction of an original kind of diplomatic history that is flexible, that addresses every level of, of interaction and that does not consider the state as a requ required framework of any history of international relations. And by doing so, that will be my last point, 
uh, you can even contribute to a broader questioning about the anthropological dimension of diplomacy, whatever the context, the epoch, or even the actors. Yeah, and some of the questions, you know, question I have is, how does white supremacy operate in diplomatic history, um, and how does it mask itself in diplomatic relations? Um, two is the archives. Um, oftentimes, diplomatic history in African states, people write books about Africa, but never go to Africa, look at the African archives. So what diplomatic history are we producing? So looking at this, what can we do with it? Expanding our archival uh, countries and based on sources. Uh, three sources. Um, I'm also interested in looking at um, um, autopsy reports, people who have died. How do how does the how does a dead person's autopsy report shape diplomatic history uh, globally? And also looking at African American newspapers. Uh, how regular local newspapers shape Ghana and Soviet relations or Ghana-British relations have nothing to do with the Ghanaian state. Um, and also thinking about scales is what Indrita was talking about. Uh, how does a, an event that happens in uh, Kamale in northern Ghana impact uh, globally, um, say globally, and how, does, how do events globally also impact the local? So looking at scale in that way. Um, and then last is um, how do events, um, particularly incidents of uh, this case racism that don't pertain to the Ghanaian state or person, as in when an African-American is attacked in Louisiana, how does that incident then become a hot issue between Ghana and Britain? That has nothing to do with those two countries. So, how can we think about like history and its spaces outside of that? And I'll stop now for three minutes. Okay, thank you again for those wonderful comments. Um, I will also be brief. Um, to me, how one does diplomatic history is a question of how we as historians identify connections, how we how our connections formed. What do they mean? How are they maintained? And the effort to study that is methodologically very challenging and also um, for some um, of us quite, quite thrilling to be able to, to trace the formation of connections and their, their, their consequences. It requires, I think, um, and this is something again alluded to by a number of, of my colleagues already, it requires research to, to be done correctly requires research that is multi-perspectival, but also crucially multi-archival. Um, and I really think that that is, 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 is key. Um, as, as Nana was just saying, if you get only one side of the story, um, you're, you're, you're not just getting part of the story, you're getting probably the wrong story. Um, so research that is multi-archival, that asks Looks, looks at contact through records left by multiple sides. Um, records that quite often um, fit together only with tremendous um, jostling um, that contain contrasting or even contradictory accounts of the same event, the same interaction, the same intention. Um, so looking at contact that way, I think is, um, this gets to my final point because the, the clock is ticking. Um, it's humbling. Um, and that is, is something I would say, how does one do diplomatic history? It would be with humility, um, with the recognition that, um, that our task is, is, is one in which, um, if done correctly, we have to consider multiple perspectives simultaneously and multiple archives simultaneously, each of which presents a set of challenges. Um, and fitting that together into a, a broader lesson to be drawn is one where it doesn't always fit smoothly. And if we um, rather than intending to smooth it over and to produce a smooth narrative out of our material, if we embrace um, the jagged edges, if we embrace the places where it doesn't fit together and embrace that both as a, a commentary on the reality of what we're trying to study, um, but also a commentary on our own um, limitations as historians. Um, I think there, there's a lot to be, to be gained from, from that interaction, not just for us, but for our, our broader fields. Okay, um, so we now have about 16 minutes remaining. 
Um, and we have several questions in the question and answer. I will read them in the order in which they were submitted. And then we'll see if any one of the panelists would, would be most eager to, to take on either of those questions. I will read the name of the submitter and I apologize in advance to any, any colleague whose, whose name I mispronounced, my, my apologies. Our first question was submitted by Lubna Qureshi, um, right at the very beginning of our panel. Um, and the question reads, it seems to me that the journal Diplomatic History should call itself US Diplomatic History instead. Should the field of US Diplomatic History internationalize? its outlook. Um, I'll turn that over, David. It seems that might be, you might be most appropriate for this one. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, in the time I've been in, in Schaefer, this conversation has come up at least three or four times about changing the name of the organization and the journal. Um, and I have to say, I agree completely with the thrust of the critique. Um, uh, so perhaps it should, I think the field does keep its, um, the journal does have some a foot in the US, obviously, but um, it is not as a far cry from what it once was. I think the uh, the US content has actually declined substantially uh, from a percent, uh, uh, quite substantially in recent years. And you see far, far more um, archival citations, references to uh, works in foreign languages and from farther afield. Uh, and I would say that the field of US diplomatic history is actually inter has already internationalized its outlook. Um, it's not to say it's one and done. It can keep going and be more profoundly international. But I'd say that this is a process that's been ongoing for about 25 years um, and has made great progress, but still has a ways to go. Hey, thank you. Um, the next question in the Q&A was, was posed by Lorraine at Chambers to, to Nicola. And I believe he responded to that um, in, in course already. Nicola, uh, the, the question was, Nicola's definition of new diplomatic history is fascinating. I wonder how it overlaps with cultural diplomacy. Um, Nicola, would you like to add anything to your earlier response? Well, just to say that uh, I'm particularly interested in how culture informs diplomacy. Uh, if cultural diplomacy is a sort of soft diplomacy, but I'm really more interested in how culture in, culture informs diplomacy, and um, uh, then uh, in uh, in this sort of s uh, soft approach to diplomacy that cultural diplomacy seems to seems to uh, indicate. Great, thank you. Our, our next posted question is from Marco Alice Baricini. And his question reads, after saying something kind to the panelists, um, I was wondering if the presenters could talk about how they see the writing of diplomatic history change as new actors and spaces of interactions are integrated in your accounts. I'm thinking about people who are not state officials and non-officially sanctioned sites of diplomatic exchange. Would a colleague wish to respond? Well, I think <laughs> these actors were um, at the very beginning of the new diplomatic history. Uh, those non-official non actors, non-state actors, they were actually the um, motion uh, that uh, made this diplomatic history possible. Or, so it's, uh, there is this change, but it's, uh, it is almost a fashion now, <laughs> you know, uh, to talk about spies and um, um, informal diplomacy, corruption. Um, so it's, yes, um, it has influenced the field very much. I, I would add that it's, um, I think, including this broader array of actors has led to some really fruitful discussions about the nature of power. And that power is not the monopoly of governments, however powerful they may be, but powerful can be wielded, power can be wielded culturally, economically, religiously, um, through any of a very wide range of, of different ways. Um, and that that is a consequential, the, the, the number of consequential actors in the story of relationships between entities is, is broad. Um, and that makes those stories so much more interesting, so much more relevant. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll boldly speak on behalf of, of the, the three of us on this panel who are pre-modernists in saying that so many of the assumptions that diplomatic history has, has traditionally brought to the table about um, a kind of 
unitary state actor with a clearly defined set of interests that are carried out through instruments of power, um, those are, are beyond anachronistic. They, they, they did not belong in the, in the world that we study. And pluralizing the numbers of actors shows the much more interesting, complicated, fragmented fields of power that existed in, in, in other contexts and that, um, that, and that were, were consequential on the questions that, that, that we're asking. Um, thank you very much for your question. Thanks to all these questions. Okay, our next question is from Robert Rackmails, who writes, how has the temporary success but ultimate failure of pan movements, pan-Germanism, pan-Slavism, pan-Arabism, pan-Africanism, influenced the development of diplomatic history? So would anyone wish to take on that extremely interesting question? I, I cannot speak for the other pans besides Pan-Africanism, um, but because our, our field, Patient Marx, hasn't really dealt with diplomatic history as its own subfield, it hasn't really been a part of it. Um, Pan-Africanism, um, at least if you're referring to, um, referring to um, uh, I mean, Thomas' idea of Pan-Africanism of, of, of a unitary African continent, um, that does play a, a role uh, in how I write. And it also is, is a nice shift from thinking about African states outside of a Cold War dynamic or framework as them existing and working with other African states and looking at inter-African diplomacy rather than African and a non-African state. So that has shaped it, but not in that subfield automatic history per se. Thank you very much. Okay, our next question is from Sanjay Subramanyam, who writes, Nicola is opening up a Mausian door for us, but perhaps we should remember that the turn in, in quotation marks that may have inaugurated the new diplomatic history possibly came from Svetin Torov on Cortez and Montezuma and Barney Cohn. So Nicholas, since you were referencing the question, would you like to respond? Yes, hello, Sanjay, how are you? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a, you know, I have so many intellectual debts, it's really difficult <laughs> to, uh, to count them. And of course, it's written, uh, it's written Todorov and Barney Cohen and Richard White and so many other people contribute to this, uh, this, this reflection really by somebody who is not, as I said before, a diplomatic historian on what diplomatic history can do for me or what I can do for diplomatic history, I'm not sure. But uh, one thing I would say, and that is that I'm always rather um, skeptical about, uh, um, about trying to, uh, trying to um, relate to really uh, European experiences where you have you know, such a, an enormous baggage, especially in a colonial context of, of concepts and, uh, and constructs and so on that may or may not really fit my, my purposes in my contexts. I'm, I'm working now on a book on Venice and the Mongols. I mean, Venetian diplomacy was, was, was extremely advanced for, the, for, for uh, the, the late Middle Ages, the 13th, 14th, 15th century. And yet we, we see enormous limitations there. I mean, there are different rules, different norms that apply. Uh, we can see immediately how treaties, encounters, diplomatic relations uh, um, uh, gravitate around very, very specific, uh, specific um, uh, um, common interests, but very rarely go beyond that. I mean, there are some limitations, even if for the greatest uh, uh, diplomatic uh, power of the time. And, and that's because uh, actually the greatest empire of the time was the Mongol Empire. The, I mean, the, 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 uh, there was a clearly very asymmetric power relations where uh, Europe was actually on the weaker side. Uh, there is no question about it. So I'm, I'm always very, very attentive to the, to the context that we are dealing with and, and what are the actual uh, power relations. From 
but you are absolutely right that uh, there is a um, there is a theoretical uh, a theoretical debt uh, and to to the uh, to the anthropologists in particular and the colonial anthropologists that is uh, massive uh, and uh, I, I try to I try to um, re recognize it uh, anytime I can. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have two more questions that are that have been posted. The first is from A. Roger E. Kirk, um, who writes, what problems, if any, has the new diplomatic history faced in attracting an audience beyond academia, or is this not a concern? I can take a stab at this and actually a little bit from Roger Peace's question just below it about the, um, the sort of speaking to a broader public. Um, is I think it's safe to say that sort of the commercial as the History Channel is much more interested in the old diplomatic history than new. Um, but I think we're gonna we're gonna do better with this in the long game, which is that we produce a kind of set of concepts, a new new set of understandings, and that will make its way into books that are widely um, widely read and widely available um, and part of a public discourse. Uh, and I think it's already starting to happen, but I think we just have to note the. Um, the sort of unevenness of, of a kind of broad public interest in 20th century relations with the world, um, US relations with the rest of the world, uh, particularly methodologically, but also to some degree uh, politically as well. But I think um, we'll do our part in scholarship and then those, those sorts of books will make their way uh, to a broader public uh, before too long. I will quickly add this, this, this does not stretch beyond academia, but um, I do think the new diplomatic history has made diplomatic questions of higher relevance in other fields. In particular, I'm thinking of in literary studies. There's a real um, effusion um, in, in early modern literary studies in particular of scholars looking to diplomatic treatises, diplomatic documents, diplomatic actors as being relevant to, to, to their interests. And I think that's a spinoff of um, the new diplomatic history. Okay, we have about three minutes to deal with an extremely um, provocative final question. Um, and this is from Roger Peace and the question reads, there is a rich tradition of critical scholarship in diplomatic history going back to William A. Williams and extending to Marilyn Young. Might we consider that the diplomatic charm in quotation marks has a dark side, which is to implement and rationalize policies designed to maintain big power domination. How does the incorporation of wider interests, angles, and perspectives relate to this critical tradition, which aims at public lessons beyond academia? I'll take a brief, brief stab at one of the questions um, about big part domination, and I'll say yes. And I'll say not just at least looking at it in uh, 1900s onwards. Uh, I'll, Yes, but also particular to maintain Western power domination, uh, not just big power domination. And so I'll leave it there and let the others answer the remainder of that. I think there could be different definitions of critical in this. One is uh, a sense of critical that is questioning what constitutes diplomacy and what constitutes power. And there's another that's critical of specific um, actions by a specific power at a specific time. And um, I think there, there is, I mean, the, the US field of diplomatic history was created very much by people who were I mean, created, the Schaefer was founded in 1969. And it's not hard to connect that to kind of growing opposition um, to the Vietnam War within the academy. And so, uh, that critical, you know, that 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 one critical stance has been in there um, in the American field um, certainly uh, certainly since the late 1960s. Uh, this other critical field that's kind of asking, a, uh, I would say, a more um, a deeper set of uh, of questions, or at least a different set of questions. Um, I think that's also important to do. I think we can we can do both, and um, I, I think the field is. A, right now, at least in its US variant, is quite open um, to sharply critical uh, positions of the first sort as well as of the second sort. Okay, well, I see we are one minute short of our allotted time. So I will um, wrap things up here by thanking my fellow um, panelists for a, a wonderful conversation and warmly thanking all of 
you who are in the audience, those who shared questions and those who um, just followed along for your, for your attention. Um, it's been a tremendous pleasure and we really appreciate your interaction. And with that, I will turn the floor back to Debbie. Thank you. Um, well, I'd just like to thank again our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. Thanks to everyone who joined us today and submitted questions. And finally, a special thanks to the panelists. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.